Welcome to the Anti Heroes Podcast. This is a guitar podcast where we are going to talk to guitar players that don't necessarily get, in our humble opinion, enough guitar press exposure. Maybe not as lauded for their achievements and their accomplishments and their contributions to guitar playing and to music at large. We really feel like that is a, doing a grave disservice. They have something to say, they have something to offer, and we're going to get nerdy with these folks. We're going to talk about gear. We're going to talk about their motivation, what they think of music, what they think of life. We're going to get deep. Uh, my name is Zach Blair. I am your host. I am a guitar obsessive, a guitar player. I've been, uh, as far back as I can remember, I've wanted to do this with myself, do this with my life. I am one of the lucky folks that have, has the privilege of being able to do this for a living. And it is, it is my hobby, it is my passion, it's all I do, it's all I think about, and I think you will be able to uh, hear that in my obsessive, compulsive rambling about the instrument. I am on a lifelong quest, and that thirst will never be quenched, or at least I hope it doesn't. Okay, so today we are going to be talking to Stefan Edgerton. Now, Stefan Edgerton is important because, well, to me, significant because I was obsessed with Stefan Edgerton, as I do talk about. I wanted to be Stefan. I wanted Stefan's gear. He was such an original, and it affected me in such a such a profound way at an early age. I didn't really know how to put my finger on it, but everything Stefan did was unto Stefan. That just I couldn't. There was no reference. You know, with a lot of other guitar players, you could you could sense, oh, they're pulling from this, and there's guys that are influenced and this stuff like that. Stefan played unique gear. He uh, his from his guitarist to his amps to the way he played. He was, and I talked to him about this. He was one of the guys that, you know, you could just listen to a hundred different guitar players play the same exact phrase and you would knew when that was Stefan. And to me, that is the hallmark of a true musician. That's somebody that's really bringing something to the table and really having a say in the conversation, which is the point of this podcast. He was my guitar hero, Stefan, um, among other guys. But, you know, Stefan uh, was one of the guys that I was the most obsessed with. So... I, I was so happy to get him to agree to do this. And I was also fortunate enough to, you know, befriend the guy, punish the guy, make him my friend, will it to be, and just sort of start picking his brain. And I couldn't have asked for a better mentor. So we get, we get, we get nerdy. We get, uh, we talk about his choices. We talk about his motivations, his influences. We talk about all this early, you know, strange gear and, and the fact that he's still, you know, from his gear choices to his note choices. Uh, how original he is and just how important he is with his band's descendants and all his his own instrumental work. Uh, he has a band called Slaughter. He did a record uh, some time ago called The Seven Degrees of Stefan Edgerton with uh, the singer of Rise Against, uh, Mr. Tim McElrath. Uh, he's just he's just one of those people that is constantly influential to me, constantly pushing himself and constantly just being and being himself which the world's a better place for it and definitely music is better for it so let's get into this with also one of the nicest guys in punk rock uh, this is my interview with the amazing stefan edgerton hello stefan hello zach how's it going i'm really good man Thank you so much for being my first guest. I really couldn't imagine having uh, done this first episode with anyone else because I think, you know, you are probably the most influential guitar player to me. And the fact that we're very close friends and, you know, family and all that is also just amazing. It's a, yeah, that's a, it, it does make pretty good sense. That's a good place to start. So, Makes great and sense. we are, and hell, we'd be doing this anyway, right? We probably would be just talking about <laughs> gear anyway. And you know, as long as I can, as far back as I can remember, I, I was nerdy about you. I, I wanted the gear you played. You know, I remember you had the ADA power amp and preamp, which if you're a guitar nerd, that was sort of the, the precursor to what was now the Kemper profiler or the, um, Fractal. Yeah, it's, that's you know? true. I guess it kind of is that weird little moment where all of a sudden everything became rack mount and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which seemed logical. You know, it's funny. Um, we've all kind of gone back into, you know, either gone back to heads or gone in different directions or whatever. Now, now there's a whole new slew, as you well know. But the, but that was just at the time, you know, it seemed, you know, pretty 
pretty kind of cutting edge and interesting. And who knows, you know, I, sometimes I wonder if that ADA sounded good. I, I don't remember now. <laughs> well, you know, I, I just, I just wanted what you had and I, we didn't have any money at all. You know, we live in an apartment mm. complex and somehow I got that. I, I, you know, oh, you maybe, had one of those. I got one of those. I got one of those cause you had one. And then you had the Dan Armstrong guitar, which if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully you're nerdy enough to know what that is, but it is a, a loose eyed, clear guitar popularized by let's, you know, uh, Keith Richards, Keith Richards uh, later yeah. Greg Ginn of, of Black Flag and, and Stefan here played one that was heavily modified. And I was obsessed with them. I wanted one so bad. And you guys played them because they were cheap and nobody wanted them at the time. And then they became these crazy collector's items and the original ones are, are nuts. But you had it modified by Carruthers Guitars out in Venice, California. You told me yep. that the first time I ever met you. Yeah. And it was a Shaler tunable bridge and Kaler finger tight locking nut trim locks. Yeah, that's and, right. And you had epoxied an EMG 81 and the bridge because also what was unique about these guitars is the pickups slid out under this, the strings in this ramp situation that was held under it with like a, a finger screw. like Yeah, a, a little like, tight, like a nice little chrome screw. Yeah, that held the pickup in place. Yeah, and so you had, funny. And Originally, you had a humbucker you can put in there, a P90, and then like a single coil. It was like there's a single coil. There are a couple of different variants of single coil, country bass, and all, all these different sounds. But none of them, none of them really worked for any kind of what we were doing. That's what for you sure. Were doing. <laughs> or so you, you were doing put either. An, an EMG yeah. in there. I just wanted that. I found a Greco copy of a Dan Armstrong, which you know the lawsuit guitars of the seventies. There was like Greco did. It was straight up. Dan Armstrong. And I yeah, remember we made one. We, yeah. We tried to route it because we got the Shaler tunable bridge like you had, the Schaller or Shaler. And I got what you did. And banning our drummer at the time, uh, this was my early band Hagfish. It was obsessed with descendants and all and everything you guys. And he was trying to route it, but he hadn't put the sort of he hadn't locked the the bit into place. So he almost drilled all the way through the guitar first time <laughs> through. But he actually ended up doing it in a really crude fashion, but he did it. And I had, I had it in I there. Think I, I just, knew that that, you know, that, that you guys like single-handedly did that because that was a, you know, that was a mod that, you know, ultimately it might, it, it, it looking back at it now, it was probably not the greatest uh, idea to do it that way. Um, but, but I was really into that Shaler bridge because it had, a, it was very meaty. And so, you know, it would have the pins kind of common to like a Les Paul or an SG or whatever to hold right. the, you know, to hold the the bridge in place. And then it just had that little piece off the back. Well, Carruthers went in and, you know, they routed that out and did a very perfect, you know, clean job of it. They must have put, must have built a jig or something like that to to do it with. And they did it for me for several guitars. And you know, and and, and I it. actually ended up having a one done by them later on that got stolen. Um <sighs> And then I bought Wait, the one that I borrowed from you, like for no, for a, no, I a had different another, one. I had bought a different one from Guitar Center in Dallas. They had one. I bought it. I had the whole the whole thing done to it. I think I had a Demarzio Super Distortion in this one. Uh, this That's was what after Greg you had knew. In his. Yeah, yeah. This was after you knew me. Actually, this was this was you know well after Hackfish was working and stuff, and it got stolen uh, in a van in Deep Ellum, just sitting there, and. Uh, so the one that you borrowed, you guys did the flag shows and you borrowed mine that I had. That was actually Jamie, Jamie Pena's from that was Jamie's. Chemical from... People that uh, I got it from Dave Nass. So Dave Nass has. So if Jamie Pena is right. listening to this, I have and Jamie. Your... Oh, he Jamie has another one. Jamie and I were just talking a couple of days ago about Dan Armstrong's or he has. He, I don't know if it's one from back then, but, yeah. it, but he does have one because um, because he broke. You, you'll know. You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. His pick guard broke and he was trying to figure out oh, if, yeah. if there was an easy replacement because, you know, that was just for Micah and every one of them now is probably broken. I mean, it'd be damn near impossible to find one that that didn't happen. Those are no joke. I might have replaced the pick guard on my I have that the original one that that the one I got from Dave Nas. Um, in 2008, Ampeg reissued those and they fixed the bridge. The bridge was this really cool wrap around um, like like 
like just a modern bridge that they put on it. I think I showed it to you. My pick, mm-hmm. I have a, a 2008 reissue with the sliding pickups and all that. And I might have been able to get a newer pick art because they, now they mount the Formica onto plastic so it doesn't do that. So it doesn't um, open your eyes. Yeah. And I might, because uh, our buddy, idea. yeah, right. Steve Doc Radin that worked at Ampeg forever, I might have gotten a pick art from him. Um, for anyone listening, Stefan and I have also share this mutual affinity for the Dan Armstrong guitar. And I developed it because I was obsessed with Stefan and we both bought some prototypes that we found those weird. Yeah. Prototypes. We found those weird prototypes. Yeah. Uh, from that were newer, they're the yeah. Japanese, you know, I was but, just playing that one the other day. That, what a cool, one. what a cool guitar. Bizarre. Yeah. And yeah. it was just such a cool design. Did you ever see the, Oh, the, so before, I guess Dan Armstrong, I believe he was from England, if I remember this right. <clears throat> he was from England, or he certainly had a period where he lived in England, and he he was making wood guitars. There's a oh, great right. picture of David Bowie with one. And and as opposed to the ones that we're used to, where the pickup slides in in that little slot and then gets screwed in, there was a channel that ran most of the length of the body, and you could move the pickup from like bridge position to neck position. Mm-hmm. And it's that's a killer idea that's That's a killer idea and then and then the body is like a telecaster it's like a it's like a just a a hunk of wood there's no contour to it yeah didn't you didn't you though there was that time where you you happened into a bunch of old bodies and necks uh, dan yes on ebay somebody somebody had found somebody had found and had everything that was left from Dan Armstrong's wood guitar period of that time. So this is wood that's been sitting around cut into rough body shapes since the sixties. I don't know. I I mean, it's so cool that that was there. And the guy wouldn't ship. I contacted, I was like, I'm in, you know, I thought you and I, hell we'll buy these. I think there were a couple of complete guitars in there. And then there were some like odd and end parts and various things. And I was like, screw it. We're getting this. We're, we're doing, we're we're just going to run through whatever parts are there. And, you know, Hey, this, this is a unique guitar. It's, it's, you know, here's one that's, here's one that's like, uh, everything is from the sixties. This one has a modern neck on an old body. This one has blah, blah, blah. And we would just kind of work our way through all of the stuff that was there. And, and just, you know, that would, would have been a blast. So I contacted the guy and said, Hey, you want to ship that stuff? And he's like, nah, I'm not going to, I won't ship it. Fuck. And then we messed up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm still pissed about that. I, was, I thought about I was, that just a few weeks ago. I was incredibly impressed with their reissues. And and it was so funny that they didn't do the sort of straight up traditional reissue. They fixed the fucking bridge because originally the bridges were a piece of metal with a popsicle stick on it, essentially. It was like the old Dan Electro bridge. Yeah. And they were yeah, it had a fret wire. wire mounted to like just a yeah. piece of wood, you know, and you could you could slide it around and move it like, you know, some yeah. loose, like I, it was chaos. I can't believe that that ever even, that that passed muster because it had the originals had either Grover or Shaler tuners, which at the yep. time were expensive. And so it was like, this thing was beautifully made. The frets were gorgeous. The necks were beautiful. You know, the whole, the guitars were, were high quality guitars. And it's like, ah, that bridge, you know. It's yeah. And the bridge is a piece of there. It'll be fine. You know what's <laughs> impressive is we did a whole bunch with, of stuff with the Foo Fighters and Grohl used those Dan Armstrong guitars, he, his might have been reissues because they had reissued. They reissued them, I believe, toward the late 90s and the early aughts straight up traditional with the original bridge, all that stuff. Then they stopped doing it. Then they did those wooden ones that they put to market and all that stuff. And that's what spawned the prototypes that you and me got. And along with that issue, they started making the, the, the Lucite ones again. Those had the better bridges. Those Cole had a real played bridge. the first round and his tech was telling me he just had to outline that popsicle stick with a Sharpie when it was intonated, like as intonated as it could be, he outlined it with a Sharpie. So he just put that stick right back under the outline and th- there it that's was. as good as it gets. There you go. You're mostly there. Yeah, yeah it's cause... funny. That's so, so now when I play with Flag, the right. guitar that I play is one of those original reissues right. that had that bridge. But I, uh, I asked Music Man if I could have a bridge to put on it. So the bridge I play is essentially like – you know, because the Music Man stuff is all very high quality. So this is kind yeah, of like a really nice Strat bridge. And I have holes. Uh, mine's, mine's string through body now. Right, right. What, what what pickup do you have in that that one? Right now, the one that's in it is a lace sensor. I met, okay. I met, a, I met a guy who was working there and, and he, he hooked me up with it. 
And I'll say that I have that pickup set lower than is kind of normal, I think, for that guitar. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not ideal. Not, not, I, 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 I'm not trying to say that the pickup isn't good. It might be, it, and from what I can tell, it basically is good and it's sealed, which is a whole nother right. uh, interesting thing. But, um, uh, so that's in there now. And if flag ever does shows again, that's possible. I have another pickup I want to try though, which was made by my friend, Alex Avidisian. Avidisian pickups. I don't know if you've seen those. He's a, he's just a, you know, just a dude who built, who who winds his own pickups. Um, He's very exacting about what he does. And he made me a sealed, um, it's kind of like a nickel cover, but completely sealed so as to keep my sweat and stuff out of it. And my, my plan is to do something similar to, I mean, I might just, you know, permanently put it in there the way I used to in the old days or build a ring around it. You know, um, Kurt, right. Kurt Ballou made some kind of a, a thing that he sold for a little while. I, I didn't know about this until it was probably too late. He had one left and Bill actually has it in his Diane Armstrong. And it was a thing where you could mount a traditional humbucker into, um, right. I, I into saw one of those. And yeah, that would have been, like that was a cool idea. Yeah. Just kind of a box to like firmly put it in there because the problem is that, that like that hole, that big gaping hole that's in there, it's easy to get your fingers. I mean, if you're yeah. pounding it like a fool, like I do. Everybody, I've already, I've already with the intro, but Stefan is the guitar player for the Descendants, uh, the band All, and the band Flag, and I just could not be more uh, in awe of you and f- influenced by you and rip you off, um, <laughs> do my dumb impersonation. Do it better of you. than I do. Yeah, no, your, your impersonation not. of me is better than the real thing. So. Definitely not. And you know, it's, it's. I, I guess we can just go ahead and, and get into some other questions. I mean, we'll definitely keep dipping back here to gear. Um, but when did you start? Like what, what, how did you start? What made you want to start playing? Well, I'll, I'll sort of walk through that from the beginning. So I, um, my musical obsessiveness started really young, like most, most of us, I think that are, that are still doing it, uh, that have, have, have been so brazen as to try to pursue it as a career. So I used to beat my head on the floor, uh, when my mom would play records, that was what I was like as a baby. So, um, so, uh, this is, I'll, I'll give a funny story. Sorry. I'm a little long winded. I always have because I get nervous in interviews, but, but, um, I really decided I wanted a guitar when I was probably seven or eight, right? I really, really, really wanted a guitar. And that's of course an expensive proposition. My mom played guitar. My mother played to me every day when I was in my crib like that, you know, she played and sang to me every day. So clearly my first musical influence is certainly my mother, but then uh, I was obsessive about records. The first record I got into was the Hair soundtrack. Oh, I yeah. absolutely loved that shit when I was like three years old or whatever. That's and still anyway, great. so it's yeah, still, still good. Still good. I yeah, put it yeah. on once in a while. I'm like, God, this is actually this whole thing. It's really good. Um, uh, well, then, then I wanted this guitar so bad. And when I, I think it was like my seventh birthday, maybe my grandfather gave me for for my birthday a toolbox with some basic tools and a little crate full of pe- just kind of scrap pieces of wood, which was awesome. And so I went out into our, this little laundry room area and I built myself a, a guitar, which was essentially something that looked more or less like a cigar box size thing. Cause that's the one right. I had. And then I had these two kind of long, thin pieces of wood that were not dissimilar from a neck in width. And I sort of figured out a way to like nail uh, pieces of wood onto the back of those to create something long enough to be an actual guitar neck. And, 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 and my mom gave me a guitar string and I, and I used a couple of nails, one at each end and put a string on there. And if I played with a pick and like bent the neck back, I could go kind of like a whammy, like a whammy (laughs) guitar. And, and, um, I think that that impressed upon my mother, my serious, you know, desire to, to have a guitar. And so, um, so she got me a, a very basic, you know, just pawn shop level, you know, introductory guitar. And I played that so that I started on that in earnest when I was nine, learned my first chords from her, um, just, you know, the open basic chords, E A D G B E, And she taught me how to pick melodies off of records. So I could kind of like 
search my way around and go, oh, wait, this matches right here. This, this note matches the one I'm right. listening to on the record right here. And so that was kind of how I started. So that's that was long-winded, but there you go. That's that's where it starts. And so at, at nine, I started playing. Shortly after, you know, I said, she said that she would improve, you know, we could get me a better guitar once I took some lessons and we did that. We got this really neat acoustic guitar, Grammar, which is, that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down, the Grammar right. acoustic guitar. It's a very cool, very cool story behind it. Anyway, right. I, I got that guitar. It was like a three-quarter guitar, but it was a very high quality guitar. It had Shaler tuners and, you know, beautiful inlay and stuff. And we got it for 90 bucks, you know, it was, it was that kind of a thing. And at age 11, I started taking that. A couple blocks from me, there was a... um kind of a nice little shopping mall thing in Salt Lake where I grew up called Trolley Square. And Trolley Square was kind of a nice mall. And you could go in there and if you went to the business office and got a permit, you could busk in there. And oh. I used to go down there and I used to cruise around. Uh, I, w- I went there all the time because it was just two blocks from my house. And I used to go there and I'd go business to business and ask them if I could take out their trash for 50 cents. And everyone was like, sure, this, that way I don't have to walk out there and let this dumb kid do it. So, so I used to go down there all the time. Well, one day there's this guy playing guitar, you know, and I see him and I, oh yeah, I play guitar too. You know, I'm a little kid or whatever. And at some point, I don't know how the conversation came up and nobody was watching him. He was just kind of sitting there. Maybe he was taking a break. And I was like, dude, can I play something on your guitar? So I grab the guitar and I start playing and singing it because that's, you know, what I did at that time. And naturally, uh, you know, a kid sitting there blasting away on a guitar and singing in a shopping mall is going to attract some attention. And next thing you know, I've got like, you know, 30 people in front of me watching, right. dumping money into this guy's guitar case, right? There's, you know, and I think he's just like, what the hell just happened, you know? And right. I was too. And so I went and got my own permit and I did it every Friday from kind of then on. So that was, that's my sort of introduction into playing music in front of people. I was 11 playing in a shopping mall. I never knew that about you. I've known you half my life, if not more than half my life. Back to crazy. Yeah, and that it's kind of a funny, you know, it's a funny way that came about. And so so that's what uh kind of what got me into it. And of course about what I really wanted to do was play electric guitar and be in bands. And so, you know, by age fourteen, that's kind of what I was doing. I was, you know, I I got an electric guitar, a harmony stratatone was my was Oh my, yeah. Wish I still had it. Um, it got run over. That's a whole nother story. But the, uh, um, yeah, so I did a, you know, I started just kind of playing in bands. And and shortly after that, I, I discovered punk rock music. And, and, you know, that's kind of been the, you know, the channel that I just sort of flowed down. Up until sure. then, I was listening to a, you know, a range of like jazz fusion. My teacher was real into fusion. So he he's the guy that got me into Jeff Beck, John McLaughlin, Al Demiola that whole scene that so that's what i was listening to when i discovered punk rock and so you know um but but then punk rock it sort of appealed to the whole person (laughs) and so that's the path i went and here we are today all these years later right well what's funny is is well a i need to go back on what i just said i've known you since I was 16 years old, I am now 48. So I have known you way longer than half my life. Much um, more than half of our year much life. More, and now yeah. more than half of mine too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, like I've always uh, also just said, were, you know, one of my biggest influences. So this is, you know, we, you and I have talked about this before, but we've never really gotten deep about it. So that, I guess that takes me into my next question. What, who was your, or who is your influences? Or, and, you know, I would imagine maybe the guys now are sort of the same guys that, got you on your path well so you know musically musically speaking it for me it all always comes back to the beatles um the beatles are still you know i mean i'm i'm less obsessive than a lot of people about the beatles because you know there are people that really really go deep into their understanding of that and their and analysis of that so on but i was just a fanatical Beatle listener. Right. And so I just wanted to be a Beatle when I was a kid. I just wanted to be a Beatle. Right? I just wanted to be Lennon and, you know, sing and play. That's kind of what I wanted to do. And so that's, that's, you know, ground zero for sure for, for all things musical for me. And then, you know, but then um, the big influences for me are for sure the stuff that I was discovering in fusion music, as far as direct guitar, you know, so once you sort of get out of Beatles, which is more like song and just music in general mode and get more guitar specific, it's Beck, 
you know, Jeff Beck was num- was was the first guy that I was like, yes, I want to play like this dude. That's right. the guy I wanted to be. I was just like, hey, right. yes, this is the guy. So Beck, and then shortly after that, John McLaughlin, who you know, right. um, you know, the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Those records they combine like the you know just incendiary punk rock, you know, craziness yeah. only with like you know just obscene playing and. So, you know, those guys, um, Larry Coriel was a big one. Uh, and then, you know, once punk rock, once I discovered punk rock, which is again, more about the whole musical idea, not just the guitar nerds. But if I'm looking at the guitar players that were really the big deal for me, when I, once I got into that, Steve Jones, Derwood right. Andrews from Generation X, who's probably our unsung Jimi Hendrix in the early days, Robert Quine and Ivan Julian from the... Um, from Richard Hell and the Voidoids. Right. Those, yeah, you know, and then a little bit later, Greg Ginn, you know, so those are, those are, you know, that would probably encapsulate the, you know, the biggest group of influences mm-hmm. for me. Those are the guys you know, I what, love. What's funny is my dad was also into John McLaughlin and also into, you know, the Bitches Brew on to, you know, the yeah. Mavi Orchestra. I couldn't believe it's, it when you told me that. Yeah. <laughs> that your dad was into that stuff. That's And so that rad. stuff was always around. And then, you know, when, when, all percolator that record came out and the birds you know it was such an obvious homage to birds of fire and then we noticed you know you had it, your the birds of fire tattoo and uh i just thought that was so cool because i was like we both my brother and i because we're you know we're music dorks and our dad was the king music dork so we we're like is are we making this up or are they actually and, and then you know to the descendants uranus is bill is playing so much like Bill Cobham, Billy Cobham on that. Um, it's also a tip of the hat to, so I just thought it was so interesting how you guys brought that in under the uh, punk rock um, umbrella and how that is what's so great about our, our collective chosen art form is that punk rock is so all encapsulating, you know, you just, you always, there was something about you from your gear choices to, to the, your note choices. Everything about you was original. You didn't play guitar, Gibson Fender guitars and Marshall amps and all that stuff. And you didn't, if somebody, if you were going to play, if you, I've heard you play on other people's songs and not even knowing it was you would like call you and go, did you play on such and such? Cause you, there's a, I've always called it a Stefan mode. There's a Stefan mode of playing the way you play guitar and I feel like that is the truest form of success is when you can play an instrument and it sounds wholly like yourself. Right, right. You find this path, this air, this this thing that's all yours, and your tone from the early days on to now. No matter what you're playing, it sounds like you. And you know, no matter what note choices or what song you're playing on, it sounds like you. Well, and thank you. That's that. That's a high compliment. I appreciate it's the you truth. That. You know, out of a thousand guitar players, I remember standing there. We played. A, we all played a show together. It was Descendants, Bad Religion, and Rise Against. And Brian Baker and I. You had just sort of started playing, you know, you were, you had been playing your, your, um, uh, music man guitars for quite a while, but you might've gotten a new one and you had just started playing, uh, black star amplifiers. I remember that they had brought like a half stack yes. to the sound check and you didn't even know you were seriously just still messing with the knobs. And then you guys had to sound check and you sounded amazing. You know, it wasn't even, you hadn't even dialed in your tone. Really. They were, it would have just come out of the box and like, you know, let's check it out. And you sounded like you. It sounded like, you know, the record of, you know, Descendants All or Coolidge or whatever it was you guys were sound checking with. And Brian, you know, you t- you two are my biggest mentors, you know, guitar wise and life wise. And, you know, but you're, in my opinion, the two best punk rock guitar players of all time. And Brian leans over to me and goes, see, it, it's not gear, you know. It's not. Yeah, here, it you isn't. Know? You know, the, the the ultimate example of that, the guy, the, the person that always really blows my mind for that very thing that you're talking about is Ron Emery from TSOL. Oh, Ron yeah. Emery, that guy, you could, you know, plug him into the back of a fucking tube radio and it'll sound like Ron Emery. Yeah. What, what, anything that you can plug that guy into just sounds like Ron Emery. Yeah. And, you know, he does, he does have a, a bit of a, you know, I, I guess a system is maybe not the right word for it, but like a, a, a standard thing that he does. One guitar amp is clean. One guitar amp is dirty. And that's kind of a thing. He, uh, he has, right. he likes to have two amps 
always. But what they are is more or less irrelevant. And I've seen that guy with every permeation of amp, every, you know, oh, this time it was a blah, 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 and a blah, blah, blah. It just sounds like Ron Emery. <laughs> wow. Just boom. And, you know, I think, I think that that thing is, you know, there is definitely, there is, you know, very well that, that the weird relationship between the amplifier, the guitar and you, how you pluck, how you fret, how you, you know, how sure. hard you grip the strings, all of that stuff, pick, pick thickness, all of that yeah. stuff combined with just, you know, there's a, there's a, a relationship that you create th that I think you just each player hears in their head and they just go, yeah, okay, well, this is the, you know, I have now achieved that as best I can with the stuff that I have in front of me. That's, yeah. that's really, you know, um, you know, Brian's, Brian, you know, is a, another great example of that. Absolutely. I mean, if you plugged Brian into any amplifier, it'll sound like Brian, which is a great thing to sound like, obviously. And, 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 you know, I know those things when you, when you say, I know, you know, you're telling me that I know, I know those things because you taught me those things, you know, and, and for the listener, you know, Stefan produced my early band Hackfish. I was a child. I was a kid. I was 15, 16 years old when I met you. And so I just asked you every question I'd ever wanted to ask anybody. And you were so patient and calm, you know, and, 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 and good to us, you know, and I was, I could not have been luckier to have my mentor, you know, my mentor be the guy that was also my guitar idol and this guy that I'd just been worshiping and buying the same gear and all that junk. So, you know, I've told you a thousand times and I've thanked well, you a thousand times, but you know, thank you again. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for taking the advice and listening to it. I'm good. You know, it, it, uh, it's, you know, it, I, I love, I love the, the process, you know, it, I, there's a lot of, I, I've been, you know, that there's a lot of people who are um, guarded with their information sure. they've you know they feel like it's a you know kind of a professional thing they've worked out hey this is the thing that i do i've worked it out myself i want to you know i i you know and they can be guarded about it and then other people just don't look at it that way and and i'm probably fall to the side of the people who don't i would rather you know i i love talking about all of that nerdy shit sure. i love that stuff and 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 you know it's funny when we mixed everything sucks with andy wallace who you know andy wallace has mixed some records that are just i mean you know, that just sound fantastic. That guy is just, sure. you know, he's an incredible mixer with an incredible set of ears. And he was really giving, you know, I, I was really surprised, you know, I was like, well, a guy at this level, absolutely giving about information. Oh yeah, here's how I do it. I do the, yeah, here, I use this thing. And oh yeah, that was this microphone. I mean, he was absolutely not, you know, guarded about information like that at all. Right. And I, 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 I think a lot of the young people, you know, when I was a kid and I was getting to see like East Bay Ray, that's another guy. Oh God, East Bay Ray. Man, oh that's God, that's an incredible uh -huh. guitar sound. Um, you know, those, those guys, they would explain their stuff to you, Greg, yeah. any, any of those guys from that time, you know, that, that I was going to see as a, as a kid, they, you know, and, and, and I would be up in their grill about, you know, about gear. They, they, all of them were giving, nobody was secretive about that. Oh yeah. You, here's this, right. and here's, here's how this works and why this works the way it does. I love that. I love passing it on, you know, for what good it does somebody else. It's not like anybody's going to sound like you. It's the same thing we're talking about. Sure. It's, it's a whole, there's, there's so many other things. You're fit. The, the way you approach the music physically, where you sit against, you know, the rhythm, whether you're the rhythm, what, whatever, all of these different things are, ultimately showing you, you know though that's what that's what you know that individual thing that you hear like why when you know angus young plays one chord you go oh there's angus you know or whatever right really, you know, those guys they say you know it's they they could literally hit a g chord and you just go oh i know right. who that is you know or tony iomi bah. okay that's iomi there it is it's done and and that's a that's you know that that kind of um you can't take that out of a person right you know? it's it, to me it's magic that phrasing that 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 signature i was so lucky early on and i still search for it you know what am i bringing to this what makes me sound like me you know what what do i have that thing where if if you know you have your eye if you're blindfolding and you listen to 100 guitar players you can know that that's me that's definitely you and that's definitely brian it's definitely east bay ray and that was sort of one of the uh, the impetus for this podcast for me 
the I, I wanted to call it the anti heroes because in my these were my guitar heroes. These weren't the guys that were on the cover of Guitar World, you know, which I'm a lifelong subscriber, and I love all those guys too. But I punk rock, you know, because of the nature of punk rock. Yes, you can you can know one bar chord and play Ramon songs, and that's why it's genius. A kid can pick up a guitar and start playing songs. But also, there are so many musical geniuses that are also, you know, under this quote unquote umbrella of punk rock. That, Absolutely. And that don't get, you know, because uh, they're a punk rock musician, they're a punk rock band, they don't get heralded for their actual playing, their phrasing, their what they bring to the instrument and it's all that stuff. So that's that's why I wanted to start doing this. Well, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cool thing because, you know, all of us like guys, you know, my age and your guys, your age that have, you know, had, had the, the good fortune to be immersed in this for, you know, as long as we all have, um, you know, we have not been able to help, but encounter, you know, a lot of, a lot of people like that, you know, cause our, right. cause for the longest time, there was no real interest in, in, you know, punk rock on a grand scale. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, the stuff you find in guitar player. That's not, right. it wasn't there. That was, you know, the, the guys who were obviously very good, you know, or whatever. Right. And, and the ones that are a little bit more surprising are kind of flying under the radar. You know, it's, it's, it's cool to, to get to talk to them and hear what they're about. So I, I look forward to your podcast very much well, to hear. Yeah, man. Some of that you know, stuff, it's, you know? it's, it's really, if, if you go down the rabbit hole of like amazing guitar, you know, um, punk rock guitar players, you know, like you just said, East Bay Ray, but we're also Billy Zoom, John, Billy John, Zoom. McGee, John McGeoch from, from magazine, you know, uh, right. Right. All these yeah. People, these people, yeah. People Richard are, Lloyd and, and Tom yeah. Berlane. Yeah. You know, there's, there were, there were scores of them, Bubba Dupree, you know, I mean, uh, Dr. Sure. No, fuck. there's, oh there's, my God. Exactly. You know, incredible. You know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I think we've talked uh, about metal. I sort of bypassed metal and there were, there, most metal didn't really appeal to me yeah. too much, but one band that did appeal to me is early Iron Maiden, which I, I hear as having a similar kind of a energy to, to a lot of punk music that I listen uh, to, yeah. especially on the, on the killers record in particular, any, anything with Clive Burr drumming. Cause he may, he, he'd have been great in a punk band. He'd have fit, yeah. he'd have fit right well, into our world, but you know, you those know, guys always bit, they, they, they always diss punk rock is like, Oh, those guys, none of those guys can play. Right. Those guys were shitty. Right. They've, they've done that, you know, forever. And that's not exactly true. That's <laughs> there's, not true. there's a it's, bunch it's, of gnarly it's, it's, dudes in, in, in our world. You know, where are you now with your guitar playing? Uh, is it any different? And it has changed. You know, and that could be your gear as well. You know, where you are right now. So over the last couple of years, it, it's interesting. I have found myself less compelled to focus on the guitar and more interested in songwriting and uh, that side of music. Kind of uh, in a way, I would say that I've at least outside of doing the things that we do as abandoned descendants, I'm trying to sort of reconnect to the, you know, the original inspirations of my youth of, of, you know, more singing and playing guitar together. I'm not a great singer, but I am, in fact, I'm a horrible singer, but I enjoy doing it for some reason. I guess, uh, I, I guess what it is, is that it, you know, I you know, when, well, when, when, you know, when you, um, hold on, I'm going to back up one second and, and, and say something about a book that Carl told me about, actually, our bass player in Descendants, Carl Alvarez. He told me about this book called Your Brain on Music. And in this book, and I had actually heard of the book around the time he told me about it, it does discuss the way that music imprints on the young developing mind. And and it has some discussion in it about why it is that we stay so incredibly connected to our initial influences. And yes, some of them will fall to the wayside, no question, but that there are formative musical connections made. So the reason that somebody like, you know, the Beatles are such a just massive thing for me is, you know, 
I think they have imprinted, you know, that, that musical thing has imprinted in my brain because as a developing child, that is what I focused so much of my energy on. And so whatever it is that I'm not, and I, and so to, to bring that back to what we were talking about, when, when, you know, playing music now, I've been wanting to reconnect with the song singing guitar combination that inspired me as a, as a little kid. Not deliberately, I just seem to be drawn into that direction. And so I've been trying to learn to write. I, I didn't give songwriting much time when I was a kid. So I, I've tried to put more, you know, the rest of the guys in my band are all fantastic songwriters. And so I felt kind of, you know, like, yeah, okay, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'll just stick with the guitar, thanks. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I've been at all these years now. I'm, you know, guitar, it's more about like, I, I learn, I, I, I'll go onto websites and find a weird chord. You know, and go, okay, let's learn this chord. I never learned this one. This is an interesting chord. Right. And then I'll try to write something with it and maybe use it in a song. Just just, just so I'm moving forward in some way. But also I just wanted, like I said, I wanted to reconnect, learn how to write lyrics maybe, yeah. you know, see if I could find that within myself. I was always too scared to do that. Try to reconnect to singing, which I gave up. You know, I tried singing punk rock when I was like, you know, 16, 15. And I just went, oh my God, this isn't going to work at all because I have a low, clean, clear voice. It does not work in punk rock. So, you know, there was not an iota of like aggressiveness, nothing that I could kind of trade on as a punk singer. So it was like, yeah, that ain't going to work. So I've focused all my energy on guitar. Well, now I'm trying to kind of step back a little bit and learn that just for my own, you know, for my own amusement. Sure. So, so really I have spent less, you know, I, I try to do a lot of like finger exercise scales. Maybe I'll learn new scales. Sometimes I'll even play over those backing tracks that you can find on YouTube right. or whatever. Just like, oh, here, I'm going to play Lydian scale. I didn't know the Lydian scale. Now I know it and I'm going to play over this. So I do some of that stuff, but that's more because I want to keep myself prepared for doing our shows uh, when, when we get to do them. And then the rest of the time, it's kind of about learning to write and sing again. Weird. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. yeah. To to that same question, I, I your gear choices over the years as well. I know we've talked quite a lot about gear right now, but you know, you did give the straight up traditional Gibsons and Marshalls a shot in the mid nineties. And as evidence, you, you know, you recorded Everything Sucks when Hackfish, my band, recorded our second record. You produced that second record, you and Bill, and you and me were going tandem on sort of the same gear. I used yeah. your last call on that record. You used my Marshall JCM 900, which yep. was- Which we still have. Record. Yeah. We still have that amp. Yeah. We still have it. Amp. I use yeah. it on all the Rise Against records. I left it there in 1995. It yep. had been- it had been retubed and rebiased at the time, and it just sounded amazing. That's a and great amp. It's a great amp. And you and I both, uh, well, it was you guys, you discovered the red box, the the sort of- um, Yeah, Hughes and Kettner. Yeah. Hughes and Kettner red box was a DI for guitar that you guys recorded guitars with. Bill still swears by it and loves them, although you know Livermore will not let him use them. But for me, on me specifically, <laughs> he's like- I love the way you sound with this, you know, cause it's, he just hears hackfish, you know, and you and me were using basically the same gear on those, on those two records. Cause it was, they were both like 96, I believe is when we recorded them. And yeah. then you went to innovation again and, and you went back, you, you discovered the sort of Ernie ball guitars, you, and now you're still, I'm happy to say you have a signature model now of their, their, uh, was it their, it's a um, stingray. It's a step. Stingray. It's like yeah, right. yeah, the stingray guitar. But like you know, they kind of made they fixed one up for me the way I like it. Um, they found a prototype and modified it for me, and then we just went ahead and made them. And, right. And so they've sold a couple of them. It's pretty funny. You you always there's no knobs on Stefan's guitars. No volume. No tone. No nothing. Yeah, you used to use a I, volume pedal. I had a volume pedal for a while, but the, that's because I was using it as an effect in a couple of songs. I had these like, whoop, right. whoop, whoop, you know, and stuff, like right. funny sounds. So are you still using the Black Star amps? Because I know you did, like we said earlier, I have been using, using the Black Star amps, but you know, the other thing that I'm kind of into, you know, part of this songwriting and more, you know, this other stuff that I've been just kind of doing with my, you know, with my own interests just for fun 
the the tones that I'm that I'm seeking are less high gain, high high ish gain, high you know mi- mid high gain. I'm going to call it is kind of mm-hmm. what what I use in Descendants because Frank Nevetta, the original guitarist in Descendants, played generally he had some you know cleaner let's say like twin style amps that was mo- yeah. you know he he had a twin for a while he had a sun beta lead he had a, you know a few different things and they they varied you know wildly as far as whether the tube amp and the beta leads obviously a solid state amp but but he had these different amps and he tended yeah, I, I think a lot of those songs, most of those original songs are written on acoustic guitar and he, he, he didn't come at it from a high gain place or a metal place. That wasn't what he was, you know, doing at all. And so, uh, I probably was a little more high gain than him in general, but what we ended up doing is, is, um, I, I've sort of, you know, that the nine, the JCM 900 and the black star that I use now, those, those amps are kind of capable of finding a place in between the cleaner sound like a like a frank style sound and a high gain sound more like a metal sound so the right. um the black star that i that i've been using live for a long time now is is um uh, called an ht100 it's not even i think their their flagship amp is called a series one which is more of a like high gain you know a known quantity high gain shredder style amp and it sounds very good i have one it sounds very good but the uh, the HT one hundred is a little bit, maybe it's a little bit more in the eight hundred, you know, the JCM eight hundred gotcha. family of amps, a little bit, gotcha. but still a little higher gain than an eight hundred. And so it it has suited me pretty well. But you know, my own stuff lately, Vox, Fender, <laughs> clean like right. I'm into clean guitars. I that's you know great. I the higher higher gain thing that's more. That's more of a like descendants, you know, I use it because I was using high gain on a lot of our records. And then I'm also covering Frank stuff, which is cleaner. So sure. I have this place that I live kind of right in the middle with descendants where, sure. I, where I'm, it's just enough, just enough gain to, to help the sustain work the way I want it to. But it also isn't just turning the guitar into just nothing. I want you to hear my pick attack because, you know, that's that's kind of the – that rhythmic thing is what the guitars in punk rock, I think, it's it's so important. So that's, you know, that's where I've been. But, it, you know, um, I'm I'm kind of more into the – into the, you know, the AC – the AC30s yeah. or the – or that kind of an amp. I have a Hot Rod DeVille that I took out when we did the Ghost Note Symphonies, uh, kind of a – you know, it's our version of like Americana acoustic songs, versions of our songs. And that Hot Rod DeVille, man, it, you, it really can break up. You can get into like martial territory with it. And it's just a little combo, a combo amp. I have a 12 yep. bunch of amps. But, you know, that's only the, another great thing about you is you've also, when it's, when, when it's sort of easier to go with more gain to help yourself, you know, it, gain is very forgiving, you know, distortion yes. is very forgiving. It's like glue. And you, as long as I've known you, you've taken the things that help you like low end and distortion. You've dialed those out. Like you give <laughs> your, yeah. your tone has been like mid range, you know, high end, top end, your low end is kind of rolled back and your gain is, you don't have, you don't play with much gain. And so you really make it hard on yourself and you, (laughs) well, you know, it's to compensate, you know, one reality of my playing that I can't seem to escape. And, and I, you know, this is an interesting thing. I think as you talk to other guitar players, I'd be, I'll be real interested to hear how, how, you know, if, if this comes up in discussion, but so I don't have a very finessed, right hand i I i'm a bludgeon i'm a bludgeon i play a thousand percent too hard way too hard like unnecessarily hard i'm gonna stop you there how hard i strike the string that's what i mean how hard i strike the string is stupid it's okay but that's unnecessary that's true but i'm sorry to interrupt you but i have to interrupt you at this point please the riff to postage if anyone is listening it is an all song it is on uh, All Roy for Prez, and it is so fast and so intricately and perfectly played. I think it completely uh, proves you what you just said about your own playing wrong, because it is a very hard riff to play, and it's very finessed. 
it's very well you know the funny thing is if uh, if it's a single note do 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 if it's a single yeah. note pattern thing like that then you know you you know you can't just oh, right. you can't beat the shit out of it you know you can't really do that you kind of got to sure. finesse those and so th- yes that is an example of a place where i'm going to uh, where i can back off but let's say we're doing our normal thing if we're playing sure. you know thank you or i want to be a bear or you know any anything like that right. there is a inherent physicality to it there's a whole body connection to the music let's call it right. a whole body sure. connection to it and i have never been able to separate the the like force with which i want to dig into the music with my whole body from my hand <laughs> So it's right. kind of like I'm gripping the neck, like oh, I'm just crushing this neck, and I'm just pounding it with this big heavy pick, and I'm, uh, and hence no knobs too, so I don't smash my hand into them, which is what happened when I had guitars with knobs, and they would just frustrate me, so I just took them all off. But right. that like physical thing, you know, part of how I set the amp up, uh, getting back to what you were talking about a minute ago, has to do with the fact that I actually strike the string in a very quick and very hard, like. Uh-huh. that's kind of what it's like and so i have to back off the top end a bunch i have to back off the bottom end a bunch but that has more to do with a whole band thing because i i want when i palm mute i want it to barely barely puff up like you know do, 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 like get that percussive thing yeah. like like a metal guitar player seeks i only want a tiny bit of that because that has a way in our kind of music of just obliterating the bass right. guitar and you know the lower the lower instruments in the band and then in our case as you know our you know our bassist is fabulous he, he's you know carl is a is a is a he's the the bulk of the strong melody in our band is happening on his side of the stage not mine so right. so we have to try to make equal room for the melodic part, not just like, okay, Carl's holding down the low end and Stefan's holding up the top end. That's not what we do. Right. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a carving out, if you will, to fit both of the things together and they operate as one kind of. Wow. And so, yeah. so that's hence, hence the, the like, why in the hell does this guy turn his low end almost all the way off? That's why, because like, you know, the part of it, it 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 makes it's like mixing the band. Sure, <laughs> it's mixing. Well, you, know. you know, it's funny because I do know all about Carl because my brother uh, Donnie, who is a bass player, grew up with and a you know, wonderful Carl. bass player. Thank you very much, and he will really appreciate hearing that. But Carl was his idol. You were my idol. Carl was his idol. So we grew up worshiping you guys. So yes, we very much know that. And you know what you you just said about your attack. Um, it kind of leads me into, you know, what I, something I was going to talk about, the human element. You know, the I, I, from watching you play, did come at it with a visceral sort of body element, you know, my throwing my whole body into it. And you and me have always called it downstroke, like chugging, you know. And I think you sit the land speed record of that, as far as my opinion goes, on that uh, Let's Bail, that song Let's Bail. I believe it's the oh, second God. verse. Yes. And you told me you had to plant your feet and just bear down and take it because you guys had like recorded that song at such a BPM. And, you know, the folks, uh, what we're explaining is it's a palm mute. So your your palm is on the strings and you're not alternate picking. You're not going back and forth. You're just going downward. So down, <laughs> pick your hand up, it's down a wrist again. Thing. Yeah, it's a wrist thing. Down, pick your hand up, down again, pick your hand up. It's what people say. Johnny Ramone was doing the whole time. But however, if you watch Johnny Ramone play, he was doing what you guys taught me Greg Ginn did, which is what got universally known as the vegetarian strum because Greg Ginn was a vegetarian back then. That's what Bill told me. And it was like, if there was a four on the floor drum beat with the kick drum going boom, boom, and then the snare going pa. So boom, boom, pa, boom, 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 pa. So it's down, down, up, down, 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 yeah. up, down, 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 up. You know? well, let me give you a little, a little variant of the, of the vegetarian strum. The vegetarian strum is you go down as much as you can until you physically just fucking just can't, can't anymore. And you have to do one up just to give yourself a one relief. Up, yeah. Wait, I, <laughs> but I started... actually do it. No, 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 no. I go one, two, three, up, one, two, three, up, one, two, three, up. Most, I do too. A, a lot do of too. the time. Most of the time. I do too. That's and so you ridiculous. can tell, you can tell in, um, Oh, uh, I, I mean, God, if you intro a song, you can hear, you can hear that, you know, uh, everything sucks and, and the, your intro at everything sucks. You know, you can hear 
the the, the, the strum. You can the hear the strum. Other. Yeah, it's yeah. a thing. And and yeah. it is it is. I think it's how my heart beats because when I play guitar, I just do it. You can hear it on the songs I'm on on Rise Against. Anything, you know, I I do, and it's from you know you guys as well. Um, so let me ask you this, and I think I know. Uh, we, we can wrap this up because I don't want to take too much more of your time. I think I know your answer here because we've talked about it because we nerd out and talk about guitar shit all the time. Uh, what's your one that got away? Your guitar, guitar wise? Oh. I know what it is. 1964 Jaguar. Uh, I'm still, yeah. I, I will lament this guitar till the end of my days. I, so the story behind it is that, okay, I, I mentioned earlier a harmony stratotone and I'll give you a quick story behind that. Near, so my mom had a, a long time live-in boyfriend that ran a bicycle shop and, um, and he, you know, worked in this, in this building it was right, very close to the apartment we lived where I grew up. And he ended up moving out of that shop. And the thing that moved into it after he left and moved into a different building was an, a store called Acoustic Music, a guitar store. And it was right by my elementary school. So I could just walk right over there and God, I pestered these poor people half to death, man. The, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I was just in there every day. I'm just the kid. And, 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 uh, actually that store is the first place I ever saw Dan Armstrong. They had one hanging oh, on the wall and I was like, oh my God, I'm like, you know, 11, 12. I'm, oh my God, I want that guitar. And they're like, it's plastic. It's a, yeah. You know, they, they yeah, yeah. completely dismissive of it, but, yeah, um, and, and they sold almost all acoustic guitars. And so, you know, and I was playing acoustic guitar then, and that's where I bought the $90 grammar that I loved. And, and anyway, so I got my harmony stratotone from them. I swept the floors and kind of did little things and they gave me this guitar and they, we refinished the top of it, which was really marred up when uh, we got it. And they, and they, you know, taught me a little bit. And it was really cool. It was a, v a very sweet gesture on their part. And it was my first playable decent electric guitar well eventually the time came you know it was it, it had a hollow body and gold foil pickups and so if you plugged it into an amp it was just like Boo! i mean it just <laughs> screamed it, it was just useless even if you were playing clean it didn't matter it was right. just a, a, a holy terror of an amp, of a guitar well so i wanted to get, you know uh, the opportunity came up to get my first real guitar and i it was for 150 dollars 1964 <sighs> fender jaguar stripped body was stripped you know there was no paint on it it was just wood i think there was some oil on it or something and it had gibson humbuckers and most of the electronics in it had been defeated because you know because that's probably a great idea with the jaguar um that guitar played flawlessly tremendously and it got stolen from me when i was 16 and i have never gotten over that guitar I and you, and you know what but i have another one i have i actually have two that got away i have to i have to give you the other one I, so after the Jaguar was stolen, that happened in Los Angeles when I was 16. And then when I got, when I came back to Salt Lake, uh, when I was still 16, I, uh, I hadn't had a guitar for a while. And a guy I met, um, sold me a sixties Rickenbacker for $50. That was fucking Whoa. incredible. And, and then at that place, acoustic music, uh, I happened to go in there and they had in a box, another old Rickenbacker just like mine except it was more like a plank it didn't have any kind of a of a contour or anything for your arm it was just a plank basically right and that guitar that one that was stupid I got that guitar for $75 in pieces oh. in a box I put it together myself and I used it as my spare for a while and it actually played and sounded really good but I got really broke and I sold it to a friend of mine for a hundred dollars so I could pay a bill. Oh, that God. guitar. Now I know I didn't know then cause there was no, I didn't know how to date them. There's no internet. There's no book. Oh, the Rickenbacker book. There were, you know, it didn't exist. That guitar was a late fifties Rickenbacker. I would fucking, I would, I would punch it on oh. to get that thing back. I wouldn't punch it on, but you know what I mean? I, oh. yeah. So those are the, those are the two that got away that just hurt. It oh, just man. It's, so, it's so heartbreaking. Cause you're a kid. And, you know, back then, the days before the internet, it was the wild, wild west. You go to a pawn shop and you find something. You don't know what you had. You know, I got rid of a – I had a, an original, you know, the silver burst Les Paul Custom that had patinaed to green. And the guy didn't care. He was like, oh, those are ugly. And I got it for nothing. And I got rid of it for something stupid. You know, just – it's the same. You know, a guitar podcast, talking to you about gear would not be complete without mentioning that you did have a Kramer Beretta and you recorded 
Descendants All with a Kramer Beretta. Did you I not? did. That was a Kramer Beretta. I when I joined the band, I didn't own. I didn't. So okay, let me give you. I, I'm sure we're going over the time that you probably wanted to because you you yes. got the most long winded interview guy there is. There, that's I me. love it. I love it. So, um, so when I was for, for anyone that doesn't know, a Kramer Beretta is characteristically a metal guitar. It has it's Floyd very Rose. much a metal guitar. Absolutely, it was an Eddie up. Van Halen sort of an inspired yes. guitar. It, it, Absolutely. It, it was, it's what they called the super strat. Uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen sort of invented the concept. It was a, a humbucker pickup, one knob for volume, super sleek, no tone, no nothing. Rose. Floyd Rose Tremlo, that was all. And yours was white, was it not? Mine was off white. Yeah, kind off of an white. antique white. So, so not the a punk way that part. came about, no, no, it wasn't. But you know, the funny thing is, it wasn't that, you know, I, I didn't really think about that part of it at the time. I just, you know, because I didn't. You know, I just played a guitar. I was like, oh God, this one plays great. This is quick. I can play on this one. So I, we bought it. But the funny thing is, so I'll give, I'll give you this little bit of, of a backstory. So when I was, I think I was about 18, I was going through a pretty rough patch in my life. Um, and I heard, I heard this record. Um, was I 18, 19, somewhere 18 or 19. I heard this um live record of the great classical guitarists John Williams and Julian Bream. I heard a mm -hmm. piece on this on this record, this live record. I think it was called Asturias by Albanez. I, if, if I remember right, that's what it was. And it blew my mind. This thing is just like a doodly 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 doo. Like the kind of insane, clear, you know, clear, precise playing. Oh, and and it's a beautiful melody. It's a wonderful melody. So I loved this song. And so I had a freak out and I sold all of my electric gear that I had at the time. And I got a classical guitar and I just said, fuck this. And I just got into classical music and decided to change okay. my world. I, I upended myself from Salt Lake City, moved to Washington, D.C. and got a classical guitar teacher. And my goal at the time was to go to a music conservatory and and head down the classical guitar path because I was just I was just enamored with it. And, and so I spent about probably two years really invested in that. The only piece of gear from my, from my years of electric playing that I had left at that time was a 50 watt, it's called a sound city 50 plus. I still have oh, yeah. it. It's the, it's the oldest, it's, it's the oldest piece of gear I still have. I think I got it when I was 18. That's and awesome. so I got all into that. And then you know, my best friend joined the Descendants, a band that we were both absolutely crazy about. And I called to congratulate, I found that out. I called to congratulate him and talk to him about it. And he's like, well, actually we need a guitar player. So I flew out, tried out. I think I played one of Ray Cooper's old guitars for that. It was a Yamaha one, you know, kind of like Frank used to play. And, mm -hmm. you know, we played for a few days and, and, you know, it just seemed obvious. It was a great fit because Carl and I already were close friends, had a, had a, uh, you know, a very good musical understanding of each other because we'd sort of grown up playing together. And so I think Bill, Bill and Milo were just like, well, yeah, well, this makes pretty good sense. These guys are already friends. And so it's kind of like already, you know, it, it, it it's not a weird, it's easy for the chemistry. Well, anyway, when I went out to join, you know, play with the band, I didn't have any gear. I had nothing. So we went to Guitar Center and bought um, that Kramer Beretta. And I bought a Carvin uh X was it, uh, X 100 B. I think it is. Um, uh -huh. That was the amp I tried out. And w then we immediately went on tour and that amp didn't quite hold up for me that well. There were, it just, it, it, it would start off at the beginning of a set sounding pretty good to me. And then it would kind of, I, I don't know, yeah. it didn't There's seem to hold up. I don't know why that is. And, and to now, now that I know a little bit more, I, I still scratch my head about that, but instead I bought a Laney amplifier. Um, which I tried out in a, you know, just in a, I think it was West LA music or something. I tried this thing out and went, whoa, this thing's pretty cool. So I had this metal setup when I joined the yeah. band. I ended up with this total metal setup and I, I was really, like I said, I was unfamiliar with metal. I didn't know that much about it. I wasn't a big Van Halen guy. So it wasn't like, right. Ooh, there's a guitar like Van Halen plays. Like that what it wasn't that. I just was like, Ooh, this one plays great. And you know, and then you had a junior, right? You had a, you had a Les Paul junior as a backup because you yeah, have that so on I, the cover of, of, of Live Edge. Of Live Edge. And so, yeah, okay. when we got to New York, well, let's see what happened. I bought, I bought a cheap Kramer as a spare 
uh, Bill said, Hey, you should probably have a spare guitar when we go on tour. So, so I got a spare guitar. I got this cheap Kramer and we got to New York and I played that Gibson Les Paul Jr. Um, and liked it. And so we went ahead and bought that. And then two days later in Boston, I opened the case for my Beretta and the neck had just inexplicably just just warped. It was like a, it looked like a bow, you know, or wow. it was, what the, I don't know what the hell happened to it. Um, we, I, maybe it was cold. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but boing, it just didn't work anymore. So, uh, I think I tweaked the truss rod and try, kind of got it straightened back out. Um, and, and then I started using that Les Paul and then the Les Paul, I replay, I think, um, the next guitar I got after that was the Dan Armstrong. And then no I played more. that Dan Armstrong for 10, I played that same one for 10 years. I oh, had a I spare remember. that got stolen and that was kind of, you know, that, that was the only guitar I had. And then I bought that, that 73 Les Paul that I used on everything sucks that I still have to the, you know, that's the one guitar from back then that I still have. Yeah. Um, and that could, and I used it on cool to be you. And it sounds, that guitar really does. It's a very, very great classic Les Paul sound. Now that I'm thinking about it, I had a Dan Armstrong that had a chrome pickguard on it at one point that I got rid of. Then I had one that had a black pickguard that I sold to Bill, I believe. Yes. I think he still has it. Yeah. And then the other one I had was like the one that got stolen was just like, I don't even think you guys ever saw it. I I don't remember that one. Yeah, when you Hagfish said when you were talking out. about it, I was like, I "There's a picture guitar. of it when Hagfish got signed and we had some money and stuff." I like, I, I bought a bunch of guitars because you know I was a dipshit kid that never had money, yeah. and uh, yeah, and I bought like the Dan Armstrong. I got a real one, like a '69 or whatever, and because they were still fairly cheap in the early '90s, and had Crothers do it, and then it got stolen. Um, oh. Anyway, look, we, I will, I will, I know they got, it got stolen. No, they don't know what they have. You know, it's like, oh, it's a clear that's guitar. That's a stupid they- thing. Yeah, that's the part that pisses me off. You know, so no. the guitars that, that got stolen with with that Dan Armstrong in um, in Australia, that one, I literally, I, mm. I, I, found, I found a Dan Armstrong. I bought it for, fuck, I don't know, 400 bucks or something. And this is blasphemy to, to vintage guitar collectors. I apologize. I... I uh I had the neck shaved down to match my other Dan Armstrong oh, yeah. because remember most of the Dan Armstrongs have really big necks, huge necks, yep. and I like a skinny neck. So I had it match my other I had Carruthers match it to my other neck and do all the other stuff, put the shaler in there and you know, the EMG and all that crap. So I did all that stuff to it and I never played it. <laughs> I took it with me and it got stolen immediately. And somebody just walked into the backstage and they grabbed that case. And they grabbed an Ibanez Roadstar 2 bass, which is the one that's used on Descendants All. Those two, oh, wow. that was Carl Spare. And those two, poof, out the fucking door. And 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 just some palooka, you know, just some, you know. They don't know what some, they have? Yeah, they, they have know. no clue. Uh, yeah. Now I'm, my mind is just racing over the Dan Armstrongs I've had and gotten rid of. Anyway, okay, I will not keep you <laughs> Um, so we'll close it with what is the, and this is, this is a big question, but what's the biggest revelation in your guitar playing life? Like maybe something it's done for you, maybe something you've realized, something you've come to from the guitar. Well, boy, I, I wish I had a, uh, I wish I had a great answer to that. When I think of, when I think of my relationship to it, it's, it is, it, you know, the, the thing that it always brings me back around to, this sounds cheesy, but it's true, is 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 like a, a place of kind of gratitude. Because I, to, to have imagined that the first thing and only thing I ever really wanted to do at all, to have followed that path and to have made it through that alive, you know, and still be doing it and that to have that be my you know, the center of my world that isn't, you know, sort of my family or whatever, like that's, that's really what it is. It, it, you know, if I, I feel more than anything else, just kind of a, when I play, I, I feel a connection to the entire 
my my whole life going back to the beginning of it that going back to you know the some of the earliest parts of my conscious memory it's it's a it's a full life connection thing to me to sound maybe a little hippie there but that it, it is it it um it sort of travels through the entirety of my life it's the constant thread and so there's there's that piece of it and there's just you know on a day to day level remembering to walk through my life understanding how ridiculously fortunate that I am to have ever discovered it and for it to have you know to have gotten to use something that was that meaningful to me to like make my way through my life i think that's probably it i think that's a perfect answer and i couldn't agree with all of your points even uh, more that is exactly how I would have answered that because it's the same deal. And I don't, you know, in closing, I, there's no me without you, you know, I, 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 you know, we were dumb dipshit kids in Sherman, Texas that discovered you guys and got obsessed with you guys. And then, you know, wanted to get out of our town to come meet you guys. And we did. And then we saw how you guys were doing it and it seemed conceivable to us for so whatever reason, you know, you guys were in a beat up school bus and you were going and playing shitty bars. And it was just you guys against the world. And we we were could not have been more spellbound with the idea of that lifestyle. And it set me it's it's why I am where I am right now. So thank you. Well, that's I awesome. It's, you. it's awesome because that's you know, really, I feel like, you know, if we were if we were talking about that kind of, you know, that path of information as it, you know, kind of goes from one person to the next. Like when we were talking about, when I was talking about Andy Wallace earlier, or, or, you know, talking to East Bay Ray or Greg Ginn, asking him, you know, nerdy questions. This, this is exactly what happens. They gave it to me. I handed it to you. You've handed it to way more people than I could ever hope to hand it to. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, it, it, it's a, it, it's awesome that, you know, both of us got to be friends along a path that, you know, that, that includes right. that kind of goodwill and almost like, you know, the passing down of language or something like that. Right. It's almost akin to something like that. You it's know, it's, it's one of way. the things that never is lost on me that, that I not only met my idol, but I, uh, you know, he's also one of my closest friends. And, you know, to this day, when you text me, I'm like, fucking stuff in it. You know, he's taking the guy from the descendants. Who would have thunk it? This dipshit from Sherman, Texas. Uh, I love you, buddy. <laughs> love you too, man. Thanks for and, having uh, me. And I'm, and I appreciate you, uh, that I got to be the first person to try this thing with you. Thank you so much for doing it. And we will talk soon, buddy. Sounds good. Have a good one. Wasn't that a great interview? Isn't he an amazing, wonderful person? You know, there's that old adage, don't meet your idols. I have to say, I mean, I have definitely heard horror stories in the past where people have met somebody that has influenced them and it was for the worse. They, it ruined their experience with that person. It ruined the music for that person or the art. And that was definitely not the case with Stefan. Man, you can hear it and in and, and the interview, just what a wonderful person he is. It's still such an exuberance for music, such a thrill for it all. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed talking to him. I enjoy you for listening to my podcast. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we couldn't do this without you guys. And we couldn't do this without the wonderful support of the amazing folks over at Jim Dunlop and MXR. Thank you guys so much for helping us out. Please go check out their fine products, anything they make. It's all amazing, amazing stuff. So I want to leave you guys with a great example of Stefan's amazing, amazing guitar playing. This is going to be the song Postage. Uh, this was on the All record. It was an EP, actually. It was called All Roy for Prez. It opens with this riff that you try to play it. I mean, it's, it's executed flawlessly. It's string skipping. So the way I play it, you're you're skipping the D string. So if that makes any sense, I think there's tab for it out there. But good luck playing it this fast and this clean. So check this out. This is Postage, uh, the song. This is by the band All. And this is Stefan Edgerton's amazing, amazing guitar work. <laughs>
you are